This is me in a flimsy cage in the middle of the ocean at night surrounded by hungry sharks. We were there experimenting with some mesmerizing bioluminescence we captured in this jar, which was really cool. But unfortunately for us, the sharks agreed. So once again, I found myself in a precarious situation, risking my life for science. And for that, I blame my friends at Discovery, because for Shark Week this year, they sent me to the freaking Bermuda Triangle. Now in the past to celebrate Shark Week, I've ran experiments to answer important questions such as, can sharks really smell a drop of blood in the water from a mile away? Or given the choice, do they have a preference for human blood over fish blood? And so this year, I'm headed back with some contraptions I built to potentially debunk a few more shark myths. And our experiments are gonna get us dangerously close to sharks in the shallows, and then so deep, it's like we're visiting an alien planet. And we're even gonna take a critical look into whether the Bermuda Triangle itself is actually cursed. There's a legend on this here island. <laughs> but of course to do that, I'll need an expert in the paranormal, AKA Noah Frickin' Schnapp from Stranger Things. This is spookier than the Upside Down. And so before I head to the Bermuda Triangle in an eight second travel montage to meet Noah for the first time, in an effort to make him feel more comfortable, I'ma harness my inner hopper. To kick things off, I reunited with my marine biologist, shark expert buddy, Luke Tipple. Luke! G'day mate, how you doing? What up buddy? We learned a lot last year, I feel like. What attracts sharks, what kind of noises I make when my life's in grave danger. <laughs> and then as soon as Noah showed up, we decided we want to get him right out to see his first ever shark in real life and to test our first potential myth, which has to do with sharks attacking people with GoPros. Come here. Come here. No. <laughs> oh my god. There's no way we're swimming like that. <laughs> no way. Bonkers. Oh my right? god. Look down here. Look at this. Oh my god. No, no, no. There's no way. We're, are we going in with that? We're going in with those. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm going home. And so while Noah reconsidered his life choices, we came up with a game plan. All right, Luke, last time we were out here, we have these like 360 cams on a stick and the sharks whim for it. Like a number of times they would bite at it, right? And I've actually heard that sometimes you go on a dive like in Hawaii, they'll actually tell you you cannot bring a GoPro because they say the sharks are attracted to like the electromagnetic waves. And it feels like, eh. Is that true? I, I think there's something to it. According to Luke, he's definitely seen sharks snap at GoPros on a selfie stick, but it was unclear if that's just because you're shoving this stick way out in front of their face, or if it was actually some kind of electromagnetic waves from the GoPro that got them excited. And that's sort of an important distinction if you own a GoPro. If we prove that they love the electric fields, maybe don't attach one to your head. So we came up with an experiment to test this. We would dive down and Luke would be holding a selfie stick with the GoPro actively filming inside. And then as a control, I would be right next to him with an identical selfie stick with an identical GoPro housing, but it would be empty. So the only difference between these two would be the tiny electrical field coming from the filming GoPro. And then at that point, we just count how many times each of our selfie sticks got bumped or attacked. And while I was obviously a little skeptical, there is some validity to the theory here. Part of the reason sharks have existed as apex predators for 450 million years is because they detect and hunt their dinner not only with the same five senses we do, but with two bonus senses as well. Their sixth sense is to detect even slight pressure changes in the water in all directions around them at all times. And then their seventh is their ability to detect electric fields. That's what all these little dots under here are for. And this matters because when any muscle contracts, it gives off an electrical signal. That's how the brain controls them. So sharks can sense a fish using its muscles to try and swim away, or even a completely stationary fish simply because of its beating heart. And so with the testing plan in place, it was time to gear up and enjoy Noah's first ocean scuba dive experience with a warm welcome from 25 swarming sharks. Oh my god, there's so many! We have about 20 terrific reef sharks here, and uh, Noah's looking pretty freaked out. This is unreal. So we set up camp on the bottom and started the experiment. And it seemed at first they were kind of scoping us out for a bit. After which, they got a little bit more confident. Okay, we got one hit on the camera. And the second hit on the camera. I got a hit. 
So after about 10 minutes, while there were a few close calls oh gosh, oh gosh, run away, and certainly some interest in our selfie sticks, there were definitely no attacks yet. So we headed back up to tally and compare our results. Oh yeah, that's God. the scariest part, right? But they swim like right at your yeah, face. Yeah, like they're coming like this. I yeah, don't know if and I then the move last move. moment, they're like trying to see how scared we are. They swim right past me and they're like eyeing me. And I'm like, do I keep, <laughs> can I like do. look away? Like, yeah, don't look them in the eyes. When we looked at the footage, Luke's running GoPro got bumped five times while my empty camera case was only bumped once, which was interesting, but I wouldn't exactly call that a clear cut result to the rumor that sharks will attack GoPros because they mistake the electric fields for prey. But lucky for us, I had a backup plan to get more conclusive evidence. I think to really level it up, I've got something over here I wanna show you guys. Dun, 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 dun. How many GoPros is that? I'm glad you asked, Luke. 21. Okay, so we're, this is a twofer. First of all, we've got a bunch of GoPros. So if they're interested in one, we'll take it to an extreme oh and they God. should really go crazy for this, right? Yeah, if they don't like this one, then they don't like this Exactly. Yeah. But the second purpose for this rig is because the 21 cameras are equally spaced apart, this is a waterproof version of that fancy bullet time rig made famous by the Matrix. Now, two years ago, I came up with a poor man's version of this by sticking a 360 camera to the end of a harpoon, and that worked pretty well, as you can see here. But we tested this new and improved rig at the pool that morning, and I was even more hopeful for this version because we were able to get some super dope shots like this one. Now, Caribbean reef sharks are pack hunters, and this is why some argue they're the most dangerous sharks in the Bermuda Triangle, because they get each other worked up in a frenzy. And so my hope was that the sharks would in fact get really worked up by all the GoPros to the point that it was a frenzy. Because I'm pretty sure that's just something no one would want to experience. Underwater, you know, up close and personal. So now that his mind was mentally prepared for what might lie ahead, it was time to get back in the water for the follow-up test. I gotta pee. And luckily, two years ago, we proved that sharks aren't attracted to urine, so I'll be fixing that situation in about five minutes when we're in the water. Yeah, the rig! And so while we conducted our supersized follow-up experiment, we took the opportunity to capture some bullet time shots as well. In the end, they just weren't that interested in a rig with 21 running GoPros, so it was pretty clear that the myth that sharks will attack a GoPro thinking it's food was busted. Now to be fair, they could almost certainly sense that electrical field, which is why they would sometimes bump it out of curiosity. It's just that it would be such a different electromagnetic signature from what they'd evolved for hundreds of millions of years to consider food. So you're totally cool to whip out your GoPro next time you find yourself surrounded by sharks. And so while we did have some cool bullet time shots and a busted myth, what we didn't have was Noah's front row seat to a feeding frenzy. But luckily, I had another backup plan because before we got in, I introduced him to my secret recipe from last year, the Super Chum Smoothie. And while it might make us humans gag, sharks love this stuff. So the plan was to have the boat crew fill this canister with the Super Chum and then drop it overboard, hopefully creating a real life Sharknado on the way down. And now since our experiment had concluded down below, I let the boat crew know it was time for plan B. We got the Sharknado. Here we go. Coming in hot. There it is. Oh, it's coming down fast. <laughs> oh, they hit the bottom. They're converging. They're definitely agitated. They're moving around to try to figure out what's in the box. Oh, they're really going for it now. <laughs> yes. Sharknado. So with feeding frenzy crossed off the bucket list, and even another dive later where Andy captured this footage of a super rare great hammerhead, Noah innocently inquired about a creepy looking lighthouse near our dive spot. We should ask if we could explore it. <laughs> oh god. Uh, you know what, what's the deal with the lighthouse? It was uh, brought here in 1952, and that's when they actually had the first accident. There was a ship that wrecked here, and everyone died except for one, one kid. 
this five-year-old, he survived. They found him and everything, but they said that uh, you see a spirit here, they call the Grey Lady. And uh, on a full moon, you can hear her mooning at night for her son, you know? So it's pretty spooky, man. What's the name of it? Does that have a name? So, I mean, it's called the Great Isaacs, but the locals call it the Ghost Island. Of course they do. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of spooky stuff, man. We should, uh... Should we check it out? Yeah, we should. Uh, are we cool? Can we go explore the lighthouse? Yeah. No problem. <laughs> All right. Andy said it was cool. Let's get to it. And while this was possibly a really bad idea, it would be a good chance to gather some first-hand evidence behind all the Bermuda Triangle lore. I thought that was the gray lady. And so we started exploring, and just the whole vibe for this place was legitimately creepy. Now, I'm not going to show you everything that happened on Ghost Island. To see that, you got to get Discovery Plus, because it has all the Shark Week show this year and from past years, like my show with Shaq and Dude Perfect, not to mention my upcoming Engineering Revenge show based off the Glitter Bombs. So to get it, just download Discovery Plus for free for seven days and after that it's just like five bucks a month. So this excursion was a useful data point for me as to whether or not the Bermuda Triangle itself was cursed. Oh dude this is just something the gray lady would wear too. But I still wasn't ready to form a conclusive viewpoint until I could do a bit more research myself. And so after encountering the largest turtle I've ever seen by a factor of four we hopped back on the boat to return home. It was a long day and we needed to get some rest because the next day we were gonna hop on some real fancy snow globe submarines and descend way down to try and lure some sharks out deep on their own turf. And to do that, I had a few more tricks up my sleeve. And the first trick was this stuff. Now it doesn't look all that impressive like this, but when you simply add it to water, something remarkable happens. It's called biolum and it's the exact same chemical reaction that occurs in nature when an organism uses bioluminescence. It's totally non-toxic and natural to the point that you could drink this water. I mean, how cool is this? When we're deep underwater, I want to see how well the sharks can see this stuff because it's commonly said that sharks have really bad eyesight, but I've heard that too is a myth. Now each one of their senses has a different range. There are Electroreceptors we demonstrated earlier are effective to hunt prey in about this range. And in previous years, I've investigated the range on their sense of smell for something like blood in the right conditions, and it can be as much as a mile. But allegedly, they rely quite a bit on their sense of sight for hunting too, and they can see as far as a football field in length. And while they can't see in colors and can only see in black and white, their night vision is 10 times better than us humans, which is why we wanted to test their eyes with this glowing stuff in darker conditions. And my second trick was good old reliable super chum, but with a catch, because you can't exactly just open the hatch and pour some out when you're 600 feet underwater. Plus, there are some pretty strict safety protocols about what you can attach to the outside of the sub due to the crushing pressures at that depth. So we handcrafted this beauty an environmentally friendly super chum torpedo we could fire from the sub. Everything is made from wood, and this middle section is balsa wood, so it would easily break away if a shark chomped right here because that's where the super chum is contained in a bag that biodegrades in the water. And as you can see from our last minute pool testing, the idea was for the sub's mechanical arm to pull this lever, which would allow the surgical tubing to contract, forcing the torpedo out, opening the bag of super chum in the process, but intentionally only traveling a short distance where we could still see it close to the sub. So with our final test looking pretty good, it was time to head back out to sea for both of our first ever dives in a bona fide submarine. <laughs> oh my god. Which one's mine? I think you're this one. Old yellow. Oh my god. Shall we get in? Let's do it. it. This is Nomad reporting that patch is secured. I am ready to dive. Nomad, you are clear to dive. Oh my god! Oh my god! Nemo, good to see ya. You ready to go on at 270? Okay, Nomad. Uh, I'm ready when you are. So we're at 130 feet right now. Yeah. And we're going 600. We're gonna go deep, man. This is Nomad reporting. We are approaching the edge of the wall. 
And the wall was basically a sheer underwater cliff, like the Grand Canyon, and we were going over it. And on the way down, at around 300 feet, you could see signs of where a coastline used to be before the end of the ice age when all the glaciers melted. And he said everywhere he dives around the world, you see the same thing at about that same depth. And the deeper we went, the darker it got. Now it was time to lure some sharks out. Yeah, let's settle down here. I'm gonna get manipulator going. I'll let you drive this. Oh, wow. This is like the arcade playing the claw game. Nice! Oh, yes! Yes! Look at that claw! Nomad, Nomad, Nemo. We are ready to fire the torpedo. We are attempting now. Oh, God. <laughs> Secondary torpedo launch now. <laughs> um, no way. And with a bit of an assist, the second chum torpedo was in play. And now the sharks just come to swimming. Here's Sharky, Sharky, Sharky. And as we waited, it dawned on me that as humans, we were almost certainly the first and quite possibly the last to ever explore this exact spot on planet Earth. Oh, the fish are coming. Whoa, yeah, this is the dude. Way it happened. The fish love go. it. Whoa, whoa. And a number of times we thought we saw some sharks lurking in the shadows, but it was always just fleeting glimpses. So we decided to try our luck at a different spot, a bit higher up the wall with our remaining two torpedoes. And here, we hit jackpot. Oh, look at them all! See, when they bump oh, it, you feel the whole sub rock. That's terrifying. Yes! Oh, he's angry. Oh, oh he's right on it. Oh my god! Oh, he's right underneath us. Holy cow. That's oh, rad. Look at that. Top side, this is Mark Chumpito. Worked flawlessly. We are surrounded by sharks. And so with mission accomplished and our air running low, we decided to make our way back to the surface. The bioloom was just so cool, but admittedly, we sort of confounded our experiment by releasing the chum torpedo at the same time. So we still wanted to see up close if the sharks would be able to see it with their night vision and then come check it out. And with the subs already put away, that meant we had to get in the ocean in the Bermuda Triangle in the middle of the night. I make a point of not swimming in the ocean at night. I especially make a point of not swimming in the ocean at night surrounded by sharks. Right. I feel like that's just general knowledge. That's, you don't go in the ocean at night. That's just a good rule of thumb. If it wasn't the sharks that would kill me, it would be my family when they saw my ability to make poor choices. Okay, Zella, here we go, baby. All right, buddy, you in? Okay, we need to do stuff! This is bonkers! Oh, that's cool, man! That's like X-Man! I think you guys can throw a bunch from on top. Now, no lights on. 
This is the trippiest thing I've ever seen, man. You guys are good to come out. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh my god. That was the scariest thing I've ever done in my entire life. That was unreal. There's like 10 sharks circling around us. Like, I thought they were trying to eat us. That's like actually my nightmare. Like that quick, you can't get scarier than that. We threw the bioloom off and then pretty soon we flipped the lights on. There's a bunch of sharks. So oh bioloom went in, sharks came. Nice dog, we did it. Once again, it was an incredible experience to learn more about our friends the sharks, and as a bonus, I survived! Which leads us to our final unanswered question. Is the Bermuda Triangle really cursed? Has it caused the mysterious disappearance of thousands of boats and planes? As a kid, I loved reading books about this, trying to unravel the mystery, and as an adult with a background in science, I was shocked to discover that significantly more boats and planes do disappear there. But there's a catch. At a random moment, you can open a flight tracking website and take a snapshot of all the planes in the air, and it will look something like this. Now keep in mind, this region here is the Bermuda Triangle. Can you spot the problem? Way more boats and planes crash there because way more boats and planes travel there. It's in the middle of some of the most heavily used shipping routes and flight paths in the world. It's like how California is the state with the most car accidents because it has the most people, not because there's some supernatural force causing them all. Statistically speaking, the Bermuda Triangle is no more dangerous for a single boat or plane than anywhere else. And you can double check that answer in the back of the book by checking if insurance companies charge any more for vessels traveling through that region, and it turns out, they don't. And yet, as sure as I am about my conclusion, our first mate Andre had a way of telling first-hand stories that even I'll admit, chipped away at my resolve just a little bit. We had some guys find like this magnetic field running through, and up to this day they still can't tell what it is. Bermuda Triangle, guys. You never know, man. You never know. <laughs> <laughs>